जय हिंद जय प्रहर आई एम प्रहरी ईशानी शर्मा फ्रॉम प्रहर समाज जागृति संस्था वेलकम यू ऑल टू दिस फोरम ऑफ वाई ट्वेंटी इन कोलाबोरेशन विद प्रहर समाज जागृति संस्था वेर देर इज गोइंग टू बी अ ब्रेन स्टॉमिंग डिस्कशन ऑन टॉपिक पीस बिल्डिंग एंड रिकनसिलियेशन अशरिंग इन एन एर ऑफ नो वॉर आई वुड आई वुड रिक्वेस्ट आर टूडे इज चीफ गेस्ट लेफ्टिनेंट जनरल विनोद खंडारे परम विशिष्ट सेवा मेडल अति विशिष्ट सेवा मेडल सेना मेडल principal advisor to the ministry of defense and patron of prahar samaj jagruti sansa mr devan shah truck chair of y20 and policy consultant to honorable minister of state for communication flight lieutenant shivali deshpande secretary prahar samaj jagruti sansa director of prahar defense academy mr sulab deshpande coordinator for vidarbha region for y20 and shrimati shama deshpande president prahar samaj jagruti sansa to kindly perform bharat mata puja I request everyone to rise. I request everyone to please take their seat. I request all the dignitaries to kindly occupy their seats on the dais. thank you ma'am we would like to begin with the welcoming of the guests on the dais and then we will begin with the session of y20 on the topic peace building and reconciliation ushering in an era of no war where we have the audience which belongs to prahar samaj jagruti sansta and prahar defense academy also the audience which comprises of youth from nagpur lieutenant general vinod khandare param vishesh seva medal ati vishesh seva medal Sena Medal is an alumnus of Officers Training Academy, Chennai. He was commissioned into 14th Garhwal Rifles of the Indian Army in September 1979. Jalal Khandare served in the Indian Army for nearly four decades. As an officer of the infantry, he was involved in operational tasks in various sectors of Siachen, Jammu and Kashmir, Sikkim, as well as the Northeast region. He commanded a brigade with an operational role on the northeastern border of India. He served in Kashmir Valley in 2010 and 2011 as Deputy GOC of Counter Insurgency Force in North Kashmir as an instructor on weapons at Infantry School Mau and as directing staff at Defence Services Staff College Wellington. His final appointment was as Director General Defence Services Defence Intelligence Agency India from 2015 to 2018. He retired from active military service on 31st Jan 2018. and was appointed as the military advisor to the national security council secretariat of india in october 
In September 2021, he led an Indian defense delegation to Nigeria with the aim of enhancing defense cooperation avenues with Nigerian defense establishment. For his exemplary service and commitment, the officer was awarded the UN Medal in 1993, Sena Medal in 2002, the Chief of Army Staff Commendation Guard in 2012, ABSM in 2015, and the PBSM in 2017. He is an expert of conventional operations, subconventional counter-terrorism operations, information warfare, conflict prevention and peacekeeping operations. General Kandare has first-hand experience in strategic operational and tactical intelligence generation, fusion, analysis and dissemination. He is a keen analyst of international world order, comprehensive national security, defense and governance sector. I request Flight Lieutenant Shivali Deshpande, Secretary of Prahar Samaj Jagrati Sansta, to welcome General Kandare with a memento. Thank you, ma'am. Devan Shah is a young professional currently serving as a policy consultant to the Honorable Minister of State for Communications in the Government of India. Notably, Devan Shah also holds the crucial role of Y20 track chair for Future of Work, where he oversees key areas such as interest, industry 4.0, innovation, and 21st century skills. In addition to his professional endeavors, Devan Shah is also a social political activist is actively involved in collaborating with government and private universities to contribute to the drafting and implementation of the mental health policy. He has also earned various prestigious recognitions for his work, including being featured on the esteemed 25 under 25 list by the Young India Foundation. His other notable feats include securing world records for the largest menstruation awareness campaign and model United Nation. I request Flight Lieutenant Shivali Deshpande, Secretary of Prahar Samaj Jagrati Sansta, to welcome Mr. Devan Shah with a memento. Thank you, ma'am. Flight Lieutenant Shivali Deshpande is the Secretary of Prahar Samaj Jagrati Sansa and the Director of Prahar Defense Academy. She was commissioned in the Indian Air Force in 1997. She is the first girl in the country to command a passing out parade at the Air Force Academy. She provides expert guidance to Prahar Vasudev Leela Military School, a venture of Prahar organization conducts residential and non-residential adventure camps for school children, MBA students, and also for corporate sectors. She motivates and guides the youth aspiring for armed forces. She is recognized for public speaking. She was adjudged the best senior wing NCC girl cadet of the country at the Republic Day Parade in 1993 and was awarded a gold medal by the then Prime Minister of India, Sri P. V. Narsimha Rao, at Republic Day function at New Delhi. Under the Youth Exchange Program of the National Cadet Corps, being the All India Best Cadet, she was the Indian Delegate to the United Kingdom in July 1993. She was also awarded Outstanding Women of Nagpur for Exemplary Social Work by the Nagpur Municipal Corporation in the year 2015 and 2019. She received Section Samarpan Award from the Sakard Group of Newspaper and JD College of Engineering. A special award at the hands of Param Kujjaniya Govindev Giriji Maharaj was given by Mardikar Parivar and URJ Pratishtan to Flight Lieutenant Shivali Deshpande for imbibing soldier qualities in the youth. She appeared as a celebrity and a motivational speaker on Dr. Subhash Chandra's popular ZTV show, Such. She believes in motivating the youth and channelizing their energy in the right direction. I request Mr. Sulab Deshpande to welcome Flight Lieutenant Shivali Deshpande with a memento.
Thank you so much, sir. Sulab Deshpande is a young and dynamic entrepreneur who has made a name for himself in the field of entrepreneurship. He has successfully partnered with multiple government and private agencies, leveraging his entrepreneurial skills to drive positive change. Founding member and president of Udyojak Vikas Manch, a body supported by Bharatiya Janta Yuva Morcha, he is active in the socio-economic circle. Currently, he is ably shouldering the responsibility of making Y20 reach to the nooks and corners of the state. A CEO, a social activist, a manager, and most importantly, a bare citizen of the young India. I request Flight Lieutenant Shivali Deshpande, Secretary of Prahar Samaj Jagati Sansa, to welcome Mr. Sulab Deshpande with a memento. Thank you, ma'am. India has assumed the presidency of G20 on 1st December 2022 for a period of one year that is up to 30th November 2023. India's name for its president presidency is entrant in its civilization value system of Vasudeva Kutumbakam. Hence, our theme, One Earth, One Family, One Future. Youth 20 is one of the official engagement groups of the G20. The G20 engagement group will organize discussions Pan India to consult the youth of the nation on ideas for a better tomorrow and draft an agenda for action. Y20 will provide a platform for youth to express their perspectives and ideas on G20 priorities. A matter of pride for our country to hold the presidency of G20 for the very first time and this is a very much G20 event. Y20 in collaboration with Prahar Samaj Jagrati Sansa has organized this forum which aligns with the common aim of transforming youth for nation building. Today, we have gathered here with great enthusiasm to explore one of the most pivotal topics that is peace building and reconciliation ushering in an era of no war. Our aim is to engage the youth in an insightful discussion on fostering peace and harmony in our world. We are honored to have two distinguished guests with us whose vast experience and knowledge will undoubtedly enrich our discourse. I request Mr. Sulab Deshpande, Coordinator of Vidarbha Region, to brief us about Y20. Devan Shahji, Track Chair of Y20 India for Future of Work. Flight Lieutenant Mr. Sh uh, Mrs. Shiva Shivali Deshpande ji, and all the Prahar ke Yuva Vidyarthi and apne aane wale uh, desh ke bhavishya. Y20 is a movement which is engaged by the G20, and G20 ke multiple multiple jo Engagement groups है उसमें से one of the एक एक engagement group जो है वो Y20 है total I guess देवान जी देरा 12 12 engagement groups one of them is a Y20 so Y20 में अलग अलग things पे discussions अब पूरे पूरे देश पे दुनिया में हो रहे हैं जैसे आज हमारा जो peace building peace building और no war का ये जो theme है ये theme one of the theme of Y20 जो declare किया गया है उसमें से एक है so Vinod sir, Vinod sir, आज हमारे साथ में है, who has vast experience in a northeast and border region, कि जहाँ पे peace building की जो जो activities होती हैं या फिर जो भी हमारी preparations, military preparations होते हैं, उसमें भी Vinod sir का एक बहुत vast experience रहा है, और साथ ही साथ में आज Devan sir अपने अपने बीच में है, जो कि white man के अपने India tracker tracker है और अपने white man को represent कर रहे हैं। so thanks Devanshi and Vinod sir for joining this uh, event uh, under the Y20 and Prahar. So uh, I would like to just uh, hand over the uh, for the program to uh, to the Mr. General Kandari and uh, uh, Devanshi and Shivalitai. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. 
Brahar Samaj Jagrati Sansa is a social awakening organization started by late Colonel Sunil Deshpande, wishes to save a medal in the year 1994 to spread social equalities in the society, namely courage, vigilance, discipline, values of life and patriotism. I humbly invite Flight Lieutenant Shivani Deshpande, Secretary Brahar Samaj Jagrati Sansa to address the gathering. मां भारती को नमन टुडेज चीफ गेस्ट लेफ्टिनेंट जनरल विनोद खंडारी पीबीएसएम एवीएसएम मिसम मिस्टर देवान शाह ट्रैक चेयर वाई ट्वेंटी मिस्टर सुलभ देश पांडे कोऑर्डिनेटर वाई ट्वेंटी विद अब रीजन एस्टीम्ड गेस्ट सिटिंग इन फ्रंट ऑफ मी and the my dear Prahari Praharis, Jai At the outset, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Devyan Shah and uh, Mr. Sulat Pandey to have organized this beautiful Y20 series all over the country because this was very much needed. The voice of the youth should be heard. And the various topics that you have uh, chosen, Mr. Shah, I think are excellent, brilliant, on which there should be more brainstorming sessions. And the crux of these brainstorming sessions should be taken by the world leaders at their platform. And there should be some actual work on the ground which should take place. Sir. As you all know, Prahar Samaj Jagrati Sansa has been working in Nagpur since 30 years. It's a brainchild of a late Colonel Sunil Deshpande. He was a visionary man, a man who had dreamt big for the youth of this country. And uh, when General Khandari and I, we were discussing, a very wonderful sentence General Khandari said, that what we are seeing today, this Colonel Deshpande had dreamt 30 years back, that the youth is going to be like this. And this is the way that the youth should carry on. I think we are fulfilling what, gender, what Colonel Deshpande had thought about. Prahar Sansta has been always engaging with youth. There have been various sessions that we have organized, various brainstorming sessions on the prevalent vices in the society and guiding the youth towards joining the defense forces is just one part of what Prahar Sansa is doing. Basically, Prahar Sansa started with organizing residential camps of small children where we started imbibing in them the qualities that are required for the youth to grow and for the qualities which are required for the youth of my great nation, Bharat. Because Somewhere we knew that the world is going to look, look up to India because India is going to lead the world. Today when we talk of Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, the world is looking at the youth, that is you all. And it's you people who are going to lead the world, carry the flag high of Mahabharati in this entire globe. Prahar has been into transforming youth for nation building. As we always say, whenever, you know, we, uh, Praharis, we interact with each other, I always tell them, whether you might join the forces or not, it is just about okay. What I want from you is that you people should become the soldiers of the society. And this is what is very much needed. When Colonel Deshpande started this organization, since those days, the society was prevalent of these vices that we were very self-centered, we were selfish. And this thing has been growing over the years. I remember that uh, Colonel Deshpande used to always say, Shaher mein dhua utta hai, utta rahe. 
शहर में धुआं उठता है उठता रहे अरे आग किसके घर में लगी है कल पढ़ लेंगे अखबार में दिस इज द सॉरी स्टेट ऑफ अफेयर ऑफ आर सोसाइटी एंड आर कल्चर वी बिकम सो सेल्फिश we don't know who are next door neighbors we are not concerned about what is happening in front of our eyes and the news that we read nowadays disturbs the youth so it disturbs the youth and that is when the youth comes up with various questions as to if we take a step forward will we get some protection from the government or per se from the local police and then that you know holds the youth to take a step forward they come back thinking all this this needs to change and i'm very sure these praharis when they grow up so um, they might become one of the um, one of the ministers or i mean i tell them you have to become the prime minister one prahari will definitely become the prime minister of my country and uh, that is how we are going ahead going forth we guided and trained about 50000 young children in our summer camps we give them some sanskar varga we teach them all these indian cultural values and we have been working amongst youth since many years and this is exactly the forum which we wanted so i would like to request mr devan shah not to stop here because g20 presidency will be next year handed over to some other country but to continue this uh, this uh, flag which you have uh, begun you know this should be taken up by all youngsters and uh, this should go on the voice of the youth should be heard and there should be certain concrete steps taken sir i am very sure that you people uh, would be very eager to listen to these uh, stalwarts here who are there on the stage they've specially come to address you they've got lots of knowledge lots of wisdom to give you and uh, i'm very sure that the youth also has got lots of questions to discuss with you and i won't uh, take much of your time thank you so much jai hind jai bharat thank you so much ma'am honorable chief guest general kandare and mr devan shah thank you for gracing this forum with your presence as we embark on this journey of understanding and enlightenment Let us first reflect on the importance of peace building and reconciliation in today's world. The path to a harmonious future is not always easy, but it is essential for us to envision an era without war. Today's discussion holds particular significance for the youth who are the torch bearers of tomorrow. In a world plagued by conflict and division, it is vital to equip our future leaders with the tools to navigate complexities and promote peace. Our esteemed guests will shed light on their experiences and insights, inspiring us all to play an active role in shaping a world free from the ravages of war. As we all are intrigued, why has Y20 taken up this topic for the youth? To elucidate on this, I would humbly invite Mr. Devan Shah, Track Chair Y20. esteemed dais honorable lieutenant general vinod kandare flight lieutenant shivali deshpande ji uh so look first of all before i say anything else i must say that i am absolutely humbled to be here on the dais today to share uh, a dais with stalwarts uh such as vinod kandare ji and shivali deshpande ji it is an experience uh, which i believe i have not experienced yet so i first of all like to thank prahar and shivali deshpande ji for organizing this thank you so much as you said it is imperative that the voices of the youth are heard heard today because and i'd like to uh, correct the master of ceremony i'm so sorry for this but the youth are no longer torch bearers of tomorrow we are the present uh, when india is a nation that is 70% young we are no longer the future we are the present of india and i believe uh, it is our right to uh, claim an equitable stake in the decision making process that for it is necessary that uh, any organization government or multilateral body that aspires to create change to uh, to see a uh, difference to have a vision of change must include uh, youth in its dialogue processes friends for thousands of years the land that we call bharat 
It has been the cradle of peace and non-violence. In fact, our very civilizational ethos is based on Vasudeva Kutumbakam, which is also the motto of the G20 presidency that we have taken on this year. India has always been the nation that has uh, propagated peace. And let's make no mistake, India has never been uh, a stranger to tough times and, and to terrorism. We have braved situations at border, we have braved situations within our borders. But in all circumstances, India has never been the aggressor. We have always been someone who approached these uh, situations with negotiation, with peace, with a calm mindset. And this is not only uh, talking about what happens within India's borders. If you look at our diplomacy efforts, be it playing a very important role in ending apartheid in uh, South Africa or playing an important role in the mediation of the Korean War or rescuing innocent civilians from the Russia-Ukraine war, India has always been the beacon that the world looks to when it wants peace. When this responsibility is placed upon us, and when I say us, I do not mean the officials and the bureaucrats sitting in Delhi. I mean every single one of you here. Because if you look at the history of G20 summits that have occurred across the world, these summits have always occurred in closed rooms in the capital cities of, of their country. It has never been done before where students, young activists, lawyers, every single individual has been, made, uh, has been made a part of the presidency that the nation shares. That is the message of Jhan Bhagidhari that I, as a Y20 representative, bring to all of you. What we do here is not a mere discussion that ends in the four corners of this room. The discussions that happen here, we want you to ideate on them, we want you to think on them, deliberate on them, and when you come up with new ideas, we want them to share, we want you to share them with us. Because what happens next is the Y20 India team carries forward all these ideas, aspirations, and the values that you bring with yourself to the negotiation table when we meet other countries. And, when, and that's when we proudly say, this is what the aspiration of the young India is. This is what it truly means to be Indian. When we talk about how India has been leading the charge on global peace and security, for the first time, India led uh, a summit on world peace last year. And that summit was very important in tackling non-traditional threats like cyber security, how to deal with pandemics, and give a voice to the global south. I am not sure how many of you all have seen the news, but the Honorable Prime Minister recently uh, submitted a proposal to the G20 nations to include the African Union as a part of the G20 countries. This is a very big move in giving voice to the global south. The global south has always been dominated by the global north in terms of resources, in terms of decision-making processes, but that changes with India's presidency. India has been focused to giving voice to the voiceless to ensuring that everyone has an equitable stake at the table. Now I have stalwarts like Lieutenant General Vinod Khandari after me and uh, I remember I was having a conversation with uh, Sulab just before uh, we arrived here in the car where he asked me uh, how long are you going to speak for? And I said maybe 5 minutes and he's like but we have a 15 minute slot booked for you. But I couldn't find it in myself to speak for 15 minutes in, in front of stalwarts like him who carry such immense experience and the servitude that they have given to the nation. So I'd like to end my speech here and hand over the floor to Lakshan Dhanu Vinod Khandare. Jai Hind, Jai Bharat. Thank you so much, sir. For your profound thoughts, your perspective as a peace advocate is invaluable. And we are grateful for your presence today. I see those sparkling eyes and energetic faces ready to hear the umpteen thoughts of our next speaker. Without further ado, I humbly invite General Khandare, patron of Prahar Samaj Jagrate Sansa, to deliver his key address, sharing his perspective on peace building and reconciliation. Jai Hind. Dignitaries on the dais, Mr. Devang Shah, Sulabdish Pandey, and Shivali. Uh, firstly, my immense 
gratitude to Ishani for uh, giving such a lauded introduction about me. Uh, when you uh, speak about someone so much, then the challenge is more for the speaker. Uh, I want to start by remembering and giving my respect to my senior, late Colonel Sunil Deshpande and Mrs. Deshpande who is sitting in front. They both gave the best years of their life for creating what is sitting in front of us. And uh, having given respect to my worthy senior, I want to possibly remind each one of you what Shivali said is right, maybe we are looking at a gathering which will have many future leaders. She said possibly one Prime Minister. I look at many Prime Ministers, Presidents, Chief Ministers, because this is a, this is a Jagruti Samaj Sanstha, Samaj Jagruti Sanstha. What does it mean? We are not creating only one type of leaders. We are creating a whole range of leaders in multiple disciplines for the society. Now, what do I mean by society? You know, the Western thought is there is a country, there is a nation. But India is different. India is a civilizational state. What it means is, at one stage, we had the Maurya Empire, we had the Gupta Empire. Different stages of history, we had different empires with different boundaries. But the civilization was the same, whether it is from Afghanistan to Vietnam. The civilization was the same. People from one end of the country could go for Tirtha Yatra to another part of the country and no kingdom in between would stop them. Rather, all the kingdoms in between would look after these Tirthayatris. Where do you see this happening? The kings would change, Tirthayatri is the same, the goal of the Tirthayatri is the same and people are contributing to this holy task by looking after the Tirthayatri. You look at the kind of roads, trails, the dharamshalas which were made all along this route, you mean to say that uh, Tirth Yatra started after 1947? No. Centuries together we have been doing this. Adi Shankaracharya travelled, our forefathers, our ancestors travelled. So what I am trying to say is let's not get duped by the idea that whatever is the boundary has been decided by somebody and they left and created so much of turmoil for all of us. But we have to stabilize and we have to look at the future of this nation. And that is where you all are extremely important. Each citizen is like a cell in a human body. Chanakya had given the Saptang theory. Saptang theory meant that a state is like a human body with the head of the state, that is say, Honorable Prime Minister Narendra Modi as the Swami, he is the head. And we all are cells in that particular body and if we all cells keep functioning, the human body will function very well. And there are other uh, uh, parts also in which he has mentioned what is important of economics, so that is Kosh, what is important of law and order and military, that is Dhand diplomacy. So all those things comprise the equivalent of a human body and that is where he had said Saptanga theory. Now we may have forgotten because Macaulay never taught us that but time to learn and especially because each one of you is a cell of this human body and you have to function properly. If we do not function properly then cancer sets in and then there is a requirement of discussing this. If the cells were to function properly, we would not reach a crisis where we have to start thinking of truth, reconciliation, looking at an era where there is no war. We will come to that also. But essentially, every society and every state wants peace to prevail so that they can grow. So these are the two fundamental issues in any state or society. 
for which peace is required that is growth and for growth you need security and for security you need growth what it means is if you have to prevent a war you have to deter deter a war whether it is external or internal you must have a good law and order system which you must be able to afford for which your economy has to grow so that is where the balance comes growth and security without growth there will be no security and without security there will be no growth and when these two go in a proper balance nobody from outside can challenge you and nobody from inside can disturb the country actually i was just thinking that you all are so lucky and i am lucky to be talking to you because at your age you are looking or you are participating in a g20 event even your parents wouldn't have been so lucky so that puts more responsibility on you and that you have to shoulder it properly the first time i possibly took part in such an event at national level was when i was in class 11th but global event i have i i really feel very happy that eminent people like mr devang shah and sulab deshpande they have brought this opportunity to you making you aware what we need to do now coming specifically on to the topic does every human being want peace that depends on your prakriti there is someone who sanskars given by the parents and given by the community make that person peace loving there may be some individual whose sanskars are such that he may not want peace he is a mischievous kind of person and that is prakriti that is natural you know many a times in uh, the teachings that we here we read we are told that we are all atmas and there is some atma which is disturbed and there is some atma which is at peace so the disturbed atma will per force create problems so it is for the people who are most able to bring that troubled atma at a peaceful situation and that is what is meant by reconciliation so the society has to take responsibility and when i am saying society now i want to go beyond a country in your neighborhood there will be lot of trouble that is generated for you why that we will see slightly later but it is bound to happen so if i take the last part that assuring an era of peace in this hall it is fine you all will listen to me you won't even utter a voice but outside you will say what a utopian thought is it ever possible for the last so many centuries it has not happened and what is this man talking about okay fine it may not have happened maybe perfect peace may not be possible but at least the levels of violence the intensity of violence the spread of violence can be reduced we can come to a situation where we should not be satisfied with that every minute breaking news that here there is war and there there is war and so many people have killed and people are just glued to the tv watching all this disturbing news i think we should be visualizing a kind of an era where the violence levels the hatred level the clashes have to reduce to a particular level and then keep reducing it to acceptable limits somebody will say sir you are talking of satyu of of course satyu was known because the violence levels and the disturbances were less it's not that it wasn't there it was there but it was less so a common man should not be troubled by the violence in society whether it is from external or internal i want to compliment mr devang shah for choosing such a good topic because and he mentioned about apartheid i had the fortune of having served in south africa and i saw the subsequent issues related to apartheid 
Nelson Mandela, who is known as the father of the South African nation, and South Africa is known as the rainbow nation, because they have similar kinds of diversities as we have. In fact, in their flag, the colors are like a rainbow. And Nelson Mandela very fondly was called or is still referred to by his people as Madiba. He was a father figure and after one term as president, he said, no, I don't want to be, let the next person come. So he retained his status as father of the nation. And alongside him was another great personality, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. He headed the Truth and Verification Commission in South Africa and he very openly went out to the public and said, during apartheid, you may have been under any compulsion, but let us say you committed some violence, you committed some sin, please come and own up in front of me, it will be in confidence. And we are not going to publicize it, we are not going to hate you for that, but get that load off your chest. And once you got rid of that, love your neighbor and let us build this nation to greater heights. So, there are examples in the world where this has happened. Let me give you another example. The world has seen the era of great wars, World War I, World War II, and a lot of people who don't have any work, they start saying, when is World War III? As if it's, it's something which is a movie release on a Friday or something. Rather, we should be saying there should be no World War III. But amongst our society, we will have all kinds of people, koi masalidar hoga, koi chatpata hoga, but this will happen. So when these world wars finished and, okay, the World War One did not give a lasting peace, League of Nations did not possibly last longer, but thereafter, United Nations came up. Okay, what is the performance is a matter of debate. But one thing which United Nations did well is to create a feeling amongst those countries where there is violence that look, we care. How much? That's different. But if there are two parties which are fighting there, the peacekeeping operation by United Nations contingents and military observers was started. I have been one member in El Salvador in Central America and both the parties which were fighting, one the rebel group and second those with the government, their army. And we used to go and we used to talk to both sides. And we used to talk to them in the language and in the sentiment which made them comfortable. That is reconciliation. You cannot go and confront either of the side because then there is no reconciliation. You have to sit, talk to both sides. You have to listen to them. At times suffer a lot of nonsense also. You have to risk your life. But that is the job of the peacemaker or the person who is building peace. You can separate two forces and that is what is the first stage. Whenever there is a peace making exercise, the first step in that is separation of forces in which you have to separate both the sides by the number of kilometers that you may decide. Then starts the process of disarmament and demobilization. Disarmament is a term which is used for the non-state, that is those who are opposing the state, for them it is disarmament and for the state it is demobilization, that you reduce your army. And the third part is most important that is reintegration into civil society. So those rebels who have handed over their weapons, now they are vulnerable. They don't have a job. If you do not reintegrate them into society with honor and with financial stability, they will again find some nonsense to do. So that last part is extremely important. That is reintegration into civil society. Now, when I landed up in El Salvador, a very typical of at times how governments function. Nobody told me that the place where I was going, 
the people don't speak English. They speak Spanish and I never spoke Spanish. So I landed up there and suddenly I found, I felt like a child, you know, you can't even tell person that you are hungry. Because your words for hungry and his words for hungry are different. But anyway, I started learning Spanish along with these two people, that is their army and the rebels. And it gave them more comfort than what comfort I got. Because they started feeling that ye to apna hi hai. And when they started teaching me uh, Spanish, I learned so many words which were not in the dictionary. Now, I don't mean bad words. I am saying those words which were like a rifle, it is not normally mentioned in a book. Uh, Anti-tank missile, it's not mentioned. A compass may not be mentioned. So I was learning those because that was my job, how it is to be done. When I used to, when I was learning with them and I was talking to them in Spanish, whatever broken Spanish and in about a month I was able to converse, in about three months we were very good, we were two of us, uh, one major Malwe and I was the senior of the two, so I was the senior of the two. So one day I was surprised because one of the rebels asked me, tell me something about Bhagavad Gita. And I was lost. I said, from where the hell has he understood about Bhagavad Gita? But anyway, in Jovi Tuta Futa Spanish, I could start telling him he understood something. He posed as if he understood everything. And then I said, but how come you know about Bhagavad Gita? He says, don't you know that the president of our country goes and visits Satya Sai Baba every year? I said, no, I don't know. And suddenly, uh, Next Monday, I get a call from the president's office that the president is going for a prayer here and uh, there is a select group of people who believe in Hinduism and uh, they would want you there. So imagine my civilization from here has connected me to a president there. Now these are all blessings of our elders, blessings of our ancestors that if you do your job properly, if you are a good soul, things keep happening properly. And there I was again quite amazed to see that every Monday they used to pray and thereafter I joined them every Monday. Bhagavad Gita had a Spanish edition which was printed in Argentina. I can bet nobody in this hall knows all this. So see how ignorant we are and how ignorant are audio-visual media keeps us by giving us breaking news which is not to be seen, which is not to be read, which is not to be heard. What needs to be done is, at times, I tell Shivali, I admire her, because she is very strict about the bringing up of you all. At times you also must be feeling, kya hai ye itna strict, but this is how we grow up, this is how your teachers are making you grow up. And you are a part of this entire process where you will be doing what possibly many of us could not do. If you want society to be peaceful, you cannot expect that it will happen automatically. It cannot. Somebody has to do something and that somebody is you, that somebody is me. To have peace, in society, there has to be tolerance, there has to be knowledge, there has to be wisdom. But if information is there, but no knowledge and no wisdom, then there is violence. Now what information? Breaking news. What is the knowledge? What is the wisdom? I am not to go that way. See the difference. Information is breaking news. Knowledge is, why is he doing this? And wisdom is, what am I supposed to do? Just get these three things right, you will find it quite useful to you. Now, uh, there will be quite a few questions. I will definitely take them on and I want more question and answers. I think Mr. Devang, you would also appreciate more participation from them. Uh, before I take my seat, I must also tell you something. Most of the UN peacekeeping missions which go and they do their job, every peacekeeping mission is not successful because the two sides may not agree. So 
one should not start criticizing the United Nations that look, they have sent a peacekeeping mission there for the last 20 years and nothing has happened. Why criticize United Nations? There is a UN peacekeeping mission in India between India and Pakistan and we don't cooperate. So it happens. So uh, if uh, there is a particular stand which a country takes, that stand has to be valued. So you will understand when we say that, look, your uh, mission is no more valid because we've gone through Simla Accord and now hereafter it is bilateral and we don't want uh, any help. So that's a stated position and that's an agreed position. So uh, such thing will obviously happen. Now, is there any particular recipe that we have an era where there is no work, there is no recipe? We, this is all trial and error. We have to keep trying and we have to keep focusing ourselves as to anticipating which are the trouble spots, orchestrating our own behavior in a manner that we don't create a problem. There are certain things which are most desirable, but is it possible? Within limits, yes. At times, no. Now, like one example which Shivali gave is that uh, the society has, in a way, started displaying indifference. Somebody is suffering and people are going by. In fact, worse is somebody is recording a video but not helping that person. Uh, now, there, there are two, three ways of looking at it. You know, our police system, law enforcement agency and judiciary also need to go through a number of transformations and reforms. The last 75 years of our independence, what we have seen, the kind of problems that we inherited, the problems which we created, the problems which came from across, all those do not have a set piece solution. We have to create some solutions. Now, if somebody stops by, then he gets roped into the case. Yes, that happens. There are certain judicial provisions and I will request Shivali that he could, she could uh, hire some or get some good lawyers to give you the provisions for good citizens, what can be done, safeguards, and that can help you to decide how much to interfere with or how much to intervene. Interfere may be a wrong word, intervene. But there is another silver lining in this, you know, everyone cannot be criticizing the person who is making the video because he is creating evidence and many cases have been solved based on that evidence. But that doesn't mean that only one person is making a video or everyone is making a video, somebody has to intervene. I feel in a civilized society, in a cultured society, you cannot be a mute witness or a passerby when something is going wrong. Internationally, India has a big challenge because there is a realization after seeing what is happening in Ukraine. People had started believing that uh, the Cold War is over, uh, United States is the only superpower. Uh, they had started saying the era of wars is over. I have discussed this about 20 years back. The era of conventional wars is over. Brigadier Kulkarni is here. He also would have seen it because we all grew together. There is nothing which has ended. When you start seeing a conventional war starting, people said, oh, it's a matter of just a month. How many months have gone by? One and a half year. It's just going on and on. So nothing goes out of the window. There is something in geography, you all would have learned about a volcano. Nothing is extinct, it is dormant. At the right time it comes up because somebody knows how to make it active. Why do wars happen? There are multiple reasons. There is an individual who wants to create a war, say like in North Korea, there is a gentleman, I don't know whether to call him a gentleman, but he is there. And uh, he is not at peace with himself. So obviously the neighborhood is not at peace. You have an assertive China where Xi Jinping wants to go down in history, a larger figure than Mao Zedong. Now obviously he has to do something. He's got a third extension. He's 70 years old. He knows time is coming to an end. He wants to go down in history where people worship him. So here is that individual ego that impacts. You look to your waist, there's total turmoil that country is about to split. But even now, 
they have hatred for us. I am not saying blanket that everyone has a hatred for us, but that country has something unique. They will fight among themselves and the moment they say anti-India, they will all unite. Even those who are living outside, they will also unite. So at this moment, we are ignoring them because we don't want them to unite. So you, you look around here and you will find somebody will create something to create violence. Peace gets upset. Within the country, people want to make most out of the opportunity offered by violent incidents, whether they are from the government side or whether they are not from the government side, there are people from outside who are funding them, there are people who instigate them and in the present day with the social media and the cell phone with each one of us, the kind of cyber disruptions which have come up. You can light a fire in any segment which is empowered digitally. You have to be empowered digitally, that's what the Prime Minister is doing so that you all become strong financially. The country becomes strong in processes, we remove corruption. But then along with that comes a price. So do we stop getting digitally empowered? No. We have to become stronger in terms of resilience about the content that comes to you and the content that you proliferate. If you are going to spread rumours, you are as much involved in the crime as the person who started it. See, it is something like a person who steals from somewhere, chor. Usne aake kahin se chori kiya aur chori ka saman kisi ko bej diya. Jisne kharida, wo bhi utna hi bada guna ga. Same is the case with information proliferation. If you are spreading a fake video, then obviously there is something wrong with you. But if you spread a positive video, then you are bringing peace. So these are small steps which I think we all need to practice. And the more we practice and the more we ask our colleagues to practice, when you go back, you convey this to your family, extended family, your friends, just see the kind of positivity that you would have generated. Exactly 20 minutes, surely, I'll take my name. Thank you. <laughs>
uh, when it, when country goes on war, he makes an effort to contribute towards the nation, and that is why I believe that war unites people. And so, sir, if this is true, then how should we look forward towards it? Uh, thank you, Shivam. You are right. Uh, growth, security, both are most relevant. Uh, whether wars are essential to unite people, I will defer there. Yes, the outcome of war is unity, that is a fact. But uh, does a good king uh, need a war to unite his people? If he is uh, Chhatrapati Shivaji born in turbulent times, yes, that is correct. But are those times prevalent today? No. So does a Prime Minister today take us to war to unite us together? No, that's not correct. So every situation would be different for every leader. Uh, when Chhatrapati Shivaji was born, now at that particular time in 1620, what exactly was happening? 1627 in fact, some people say 1630, at that stage, there had been a number of invasions from across and even the entire length and breadth of the country could not stop these invasions and people had gone right down to Deccan and the great Yadav empire of Devagiri was destroyed, the, uh, the Krishna Devraya Vijayanagar empire was also destroyed and there seemed to be absolute gloom because there were five of these invaders, Bhamni Kingdom, Kutubshai, all those were there and what was there to give hope to the farmer? The common citizen was the farmer. So Shivaji had to give a hope to the farmer to say, we have not been like this all through. We have always been independent. Swaraj, Khudka Raj. So that is when he took up the cause to expel the invaders wherever they may have come from and get the same self-esteem for the poor farmer. Otherwise, what used to happen? Either se Adil Shahi ne attack kar di, se Kutub Shahi ne attack kar di, se Moglo ne attack kar di, Portuguese were doing whatever they were doing in Goa and Bombay. What was the life? This was not the life of, a, of an Indian or like even our constitution says India that is Bharat. So this was not the life of Bharat or Bharatiya. So he, what he did at that time was perfect, absolutely right. Okay, look at another uh, great queen, Ailevai. She united the Holkar kingdom based on good governance based on prosperity, she renovated practically every temple which had been destroyed or demolished. So what was that? She was uniting people by her vision and by the kind of uh, acts that she was doing. So I am giving you somewhere around about a difference of 100 to 200 years around that time. And when you come to this present era, any country which goes to war, it's a very costly affair. You put your country back by 10, 20, 30 years. What happened after World War II? Germany was devastated, even Russia was devastated, Spain was devastated despite the fact that they had not actively participated, France, Italy totally devastated, Poland devastated. So that entire European belt was gone. It is only because of the Marshall Plan where USA brought all that money that a new Europe emerged. If we go through some exercise of this kind, there is no Marshall Plan awaiting for you from outside. So better be strong and deter a war. So instead of waiting for somebody to give you money, generate money. Make your economy strong. Prosperity will unite you and prevention of a war based on your own capability will unite you. After World War II, the European nations outsourced their unit, the security to NATO. They reduced their expenditure on security and see where they have landed. Now suddenly they are increasing their budget by five times. 
इवन इफ यू इंक्रीज द बजट बाय फाइव टाइम्स फैक्ट्री तो उतना ही बनाएगा जितनी उसकी कैपेसिटी है सो वाई इट मे बी ट्रू इन सर्टन सर्कमस्टांसिस वॉट इज इंपॉर्टेंट इज ग्रोथ ऑफ अ सोसाइटी एंड प्रिवेंशन ऑफ वॉर शुड बी दूनिफाइंग फैक्टर थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू सो मच सर so so can we say that crisis brings out the best in humanity you saw covid yes sir somebody imposed covid on us we did not impose anything on them right. and we showed our cultural and historical values civilizational values which we have right we don't even blame them openly yes sir thank you so much sir now we take the next question Yes, please. Jain Jabra sir, my name is Pradi Prerna Meragani. I am studying in first standard and preparing for India entrance examination. So, my question is: Countries are nowadays engaged in various warfare for various reasons like resources, territory, dominance, etc. So, countries are uh, countries are really uh, uh, trying to expand their boundaries and interfering in the uh, internal affairs of other countries for their personal greed and to exploit their natural resources for example usa usa has exploited in the countries of middle east for their personal greed talking about china china is also trying to expand their borders to exploit or to dominate over the neighboring countries like ne nepal and bhutan so sir even if a single country expanded and control the whole world there would be still conflicts moreover there would be no uh, growth as there would be no competition and the reason for the war would be still uh, exist so sir what can a nation do to disengage the militarily and try to uh, decrease the tensions between them absolutely correct what you said you are reading about the present situation is absolutely correct that uh, the quest for resources the quest for uh, dominating the uh, resource pool Uh, whether it is oil whether it is technology whatever uh, raw material rare earth material whatever it is uh, there is an urge among some countries to dominate that and thereafter leverage that so that the behavior of other countries falls in line with their thinking i just want to uh, tell you is this the first time it has happened and is it the first time you have seen it what brought east india company here they came here for resources not out of love for us <laughs> take a small example uh, i am also from vidar as much as you are and you look at how things happened and it is always best to give an example to the sons or daughters of the soil so that you remember life long before the british came the diet here was very simple and the cultivation was something which is good enough for a family you were not into commercialization of agriculture or things like that the british came here and they realized that here in vidar cotton can grow well in bengal they realized jute can grow well in bihar they realized indigo can grow well and they immediately went in for change over in the cropping pattern most of the land in vidar came under cotton cultivation during that time we did not need that they needed it because they were going through industrial revolution they wanted cotton how many of you know that there is a railway line or there was a railway line shakuntala railway line in vidar just raise your hands okay go and google you will see what is shakuntala railway line shakuntala railway line was moving from achalpur yavatma murtidapur for what there was not sight seen it had eight bogies out of those six used to carry cotton all the cotton used to be collected at murtidapur from where it used to get into the bigger railway and go to bombay from where it used to be sent to manchester from manchester that cloth used to come we used to buy that cloth who was benefiting out of that whose resource was it our east india company so it was our resource they came here to take our resource otherwise do you think if you take every inch of united kingdom could they have grown cotton there could they have grown uh, jute there could they have grown indigo there no 
so they made it they made us do what they wanted us to wanted them to be doing africa the americans went into africa made slaves out of them and took them to america for their agriculture cotton sugar cane when slavery was banned in usa the human resource now i am talking of resource human resource it suddenly went out of the window now what do you do the british were very clever they immediately said we will not call them slaves we will call them call them indentured labor 1850 to 1880 from india ship loads of people were taking to mauritius to seychelles to south africa to malaysia to west indies these were the indentured labor they never came back they couldn't have come back they are still there from where did they go they went from bihar bengal andhra karnataka tamil nadu possibly we were saved because there were enough people from the other places why were there people who were wanting to go as indentured labor because they were starving they had nothing to eat so they went and they stayed there okay now to their credit they have done well but this is a continuous fight for resource where is it how do i get it out today that whole thing has shifted into oil energy tomorrow that same thing will transform into water we may have water wars because anything that is important and which is getting scarce is required so now water china has started diverting water now what happens india and china will have a tense relationship what should we do instead of cribbing about what china is doing we should look and tap the water which is going waste every flood water is going away we are responsible for that we should correct it every day whatever water you waste stop that otherwise within the next 20 years you will see india to be the most water stressed area in this part of the world so resource rivalry will happen identify what are the future pain points identify what is the correct one and see what can i do for that so uh, so sir uh, means is that need that they needed so they control us is it means yes that's exactly how it is whoever needs a resource in whatever manner and if they are today powerful nations they will twist you so what is the option instead of grudging and cribbing become powerful thank you sir so no wonder why bharat is called as sone ki chidiya with this let us take our next question yes please Jai Hind Jai Prahar sir I am Prahari Karis Francis and I'm preparing for the NDA written examination so many major wars have occurred in the past taking a major example of the world war where during the world war a huge amount of damage and destruction was caused a light pass blame germany for the damage and hence germany had to pay heavy compensation which led to the economic downfall of germany and eventually led to world war 2 a similar situation is seen in russia and ukraine where the entire world blames russia even though it was provoked by nato countries so alliances like quad and nato are marking china as a threat to the existing world order and portraying them as enemies so so my question to you is What are the lessons from the past to avoid situations like Russia and Ukraine? And is it just for the world to blame emerging superpowers like Russia, where we talk about world peace? You are absolutely right. What are the lessons? We must definitely look at that. We have seen uh, 
we have experienced, we have generations here who have seen so many wars. Wars are not desirable. And uh, especially somebody else's war being fought by you is least desirable. Now imagine uh, the West wants to reduce the influence of Russia. So there is an expansion or at least a dream given to Ukraine that look, you behave like this and we will take you into NATO. And uh, the question is, has Russia gone to resist NATO or NATO has come to trouble Russia? So you got to understand that. Okay, fine. Even if there is a war, who is suffering most? Ukraine. Energy supply to Europe is still continuing. So those people who are provoking these people and giving them F-16s or the Leopard tanks, they are still getting their energy supplies, maybe less, but they are still getting it, no? And they have not been so morally upright to say, look, because the, these people are wrong, so we will stop taking energy. No, they haven't. And they are paying them. And whatever money they are paying, Russia is utilizing that. So here is the place where strategic culture and strategic thinking of every civilization is important. Do I meddle with somebody else? Because these two big elephants are going to fight. So do I become one uh, person who is fighting on behalf of the other elephant? You know there is a saying, when elephants fight, the grass gets trampled. Do you want to be that grass? You have to decide. If President Zelensky had decided what was good for Ukraine, I don't think this situation would have come up. What is the lesson? Your political leadership and the nation should be very clear, is this my war or is this somebody else's war? Being fought on my uh, terrain and the sufferings are to my people. You think India has not been provoked? India has been provoked by one of the superpower to take a uh, fight with somebody else. We have been telling them, listen, you are a superpower, fine. But this is my decision and we are not going to fight because you want us to fight. So when it comes to court, you mentioned correctly. Court came up not for a military alliance. It came as a response to tsunami. It came up for a humanitarian cause. And see where it was being taken to a level where we were being told that okay, we will look after Pacific, you look after Indian Ocean region. We said, even if you don't tell us, we will still look after Indian Ocean region. That is our backyard. We will look after it. You don't have to tell us. And let us assume that we don't become active military members in court. You mean to say we will neglect Indian Ocean region? We will not. And tomorrow if we have a fight with China on the Himalayas, you think anyone will come to you? You will have to fight it yourself. So your fight is your fight. The others, at best, may tell you, okay, take five tanks, take twenty tanks. How does that matter? We make our own tanks in Madras. So, here the strategic culture, strategic thinking, and that is where I appreciate the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister. When they say, look, your problem, please sort out yourself. My problem, I will sort out myself. I will take my decision as, as which is most relevant as per my national interest today and tomorrow. Thank you, sir. Sir, I remember a statement by Albert Einstein. I know not with what World War III will be fought, but I know World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. And this statement is enough to understand the importance of peace building and reconciliation in today's era. There is uh, another saying where people uh, asked another learned man, Plato, uh, when will there be a last war? So he said, when the second last man on earth dies. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Let's take our next question. Yes, please. Jain Jaipra sir. So my name is Prahari Sani Kumar and I am currently preparing for my SSB interview for the CDS and African examinations. 
Sir, my question is related to nuclear power. Sir, as someone uh, mentioned, whenever we hear the words nuclear war, we think of chaos and destruction. So, but given the example of World War II, we saw that uh, USA uh, bombed Japan and that eventually led to Japan surrendering and ending the war. So, thus peace was established using the uh, weapon of mass destruction. So, so, what are your views on this? And sir, as someone mentioned about uh, Russia and Ukraine war, so we see that uh, USA has been deploying their nuclear warheads in the bordering countries, in the NATO countries bordering Russia. And in response, now Russia is also deploying their warheads in uh, Belarus. And so these uh, developed nations, uh, they have their, uh, built, they have built up their nuclear, nuclear arsenals and are now putting sanctions on smaller countries which are trying to build up their nuclear programs. So we saw uh, the case with India as well, when we were developing our program, uh, uh, USA put heavy sanctions on us and uh, that uh, affected us severely. So my question to you is, uh, should these uh, developing nations or the conflict rate nations focus on, on developing nuclear programs rather than development when we are talking about global peace? So. Sir, I want to ask a connecting question. Jai Jai Prasar, my name is Prahari Shiva Mugde and I am preparing for, UC, for UPSC CDS examination. Sir, our then, uh, our then Defense Minister, uh, the late Mr. Manohar Parrikar spoke about India's no first use nuclear policy. Sir, if there is a two front war with China and Pakistan, then should India consider using nuclear, uh, nuclear weapon first to establish peace? So as the case with USA in World War II, sir, what are your views on India's no 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 use first no first use nuclear pol nuclear policy? Okay, uh, two parts of the similar issue on uh, nuclear part. The first part is uh, do nuclear wars, new do nuclear powers or the capability stop wars? That is the first question, and second is about no first use policy. After World War II, there was no World War III, which is a fact. The two superpowers, because we got into a bipolar global geopolitical situation and both got into an arms race, uh, they were preparing themselves and nuclear warheads were increasing at a very rapid pace. And then as if that was not enough, then they went into a space race. Now comes the most interesting part. There was no conventional war, but what happened to USSR? As an outcome of the arms race, they went bankrupt. USSR just collapsed. So they didn't even exist to fight a war. And all those nuclear warheads and installations, they got divided because they were all divided in various countries or various states which became countries. So maybe it is good that it avoids a world war, that I can understand. But does that mean after World War II there have been no wars? There have been plenty of wars. The only thing is those people who had nuclear warheads, what kind of war did they indulge in? Pakistan is a nuclear power. They may not have had a conventional war against us, but the kind of sub-conventional war they have waged on us, proxy war, it is costlier than a conventional war. The kind of miseries they have inflicted in Punjab, they have inflicted in Kashmir, and why Kashmir? There was a particular era where anywhere a bomb explosion used to take place. Remember what happened in Bombay in 93, what happened 26-11? So nuclear power, if it is mischievous, if it is evil, it will do anything under the nuclear umbrella and keep it at a level that you can't get into a conventional war, but a policy of thousand cuts to bleed you will continue to happen. So what does that mean? You have nuclear power as well as other capabilities to ensure that your society is still kept peaceful. So nuclear Weapons are not the only solution that now I have got 500 nuclear warhead, now I can sleep. No one will allow you to sleep. Today, China is going full speed trying to increase its nuclear stockpile. Why? It is challenging the position of USA. So you will see many things unfolding. 
but because it doesn't have the same number of nuclear warheads has it stopped china from doing what it is doing in cyber warfare it is stealing knowledge from usa so all kinds of warfare will continue economic warfare will continue intellectually uh, intellectual property rights warfare will continue environmental warfare will continue the agricultural security will get compromised so all these things will happen so when you look at how to keep your country safe every particular domain has to be kept safe which means the job of keeping your country safe does not stop at armed forces doorstep that's what i started by saying okay coming on to uh, no first use incidentally i was in that gathering when mr banwar parikar said that and uh, we all smiled because we knew what he was doing you must confuse your enemy and that's what he did and thereafter two days later he went to the media and said this was my personal opinion <laughs> so when a defense minister gives his personal opinion you can understand your adversary's color of his trouser what would have happened so such things are also part of state craft you announce something you let them react then you know what is the reaction then you say okay no don't worry i didn't mean it <laughs> to front war obviously we will do what is good for us you think we will not do but why should we announce in a locality in a locality there is a pehlwan every day he goes and disturbs everyone and there is a person who is preparing a sword but he is not telling anyone one day he just goes and cuts it that's it that is your strategic thinking that is your strategic culture you don't have to announce everything why should you announce so every time when people say na wo uska proof do iska evidence do not required have trust in each other believe in what is being done by your country is right support those people who are risking their life for you and finally you will realize that the other side will come to a stage you see what has happened in pakistan today they are absolutely in a miserable position in china also you may feel that uh, everything is all right comparatively our youth population is more their youth population is less what is not visible today in the next 5 years or 10 years it will be visible provided our youth our skill if we have only numbers but no skills it won't help if we have numbers skills but no attitude it won't help so we have two identified adversaries at least let us play our game correctly with them and if we play our cards well nobody can disturb us and our future generations can be quite safe and secure thanks thanks sir i remember a statement uh, said by us press our former us president uh, ronald uh, reagan so he mentioned that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought and the only value there is our two nations possessing nuclear weapon is to make sure they will never be uh, used but then would it not be better to do away with them entirely there are certain disarmament uh, treaty processes which had started uh, there was one concept of mutual assured destruction the acronym is mad that is you fire 20 and i will also fire 20 if i don't live you will also not live that is a kind of a absolute bad man status so that was what was going on and thereafter uh, both the super powers decided to sit up around the table and uh, strategic arms limitation talks salt is what started happening and then the grand announcements started coming that you know usa has uh, destroyed 5000 warheads and russia has destroyed 3000 warheads don't get fooled by all that because whatever was not workable was destroyed so the countries play games you have to be wise enough to understand that in an idealistic world everything should be removed will it happen no it won't happen thank you so much sir let's take our next question please yes please Jai Hind, Jai Bharat, sir. My name is Tari Sishtirao, and uh, I am preparing for the NDA written examination. 
Sir, the developed nations have been interfering in the internal affairs of the other countries. Let's say USA, which have the policy that uh, threat to democracy anywhere is threat to democracy everywhere. So they use this to justify their interference in other countries' internal issues. Sir, even when their own houses is not in order, there's a saying that you're more likely to be killed by a teenager with a gun in the USA than in Afghanistan. Reports of gun violence make headlines almost every day there. Sir, so my question to you is, is it right for countries like USA to be the center of discussion on peace building and peace keeping discussions when they are the one of the main uh, contributors of every conflict? Uh, USA has a record of interfering, no doubt about it. Uh, they have another record. When things go wrong, they run away. They have been quite consistent in doing that in Vietnam and in Afghanistan. But it is not so innocent. You have to think beyond that as to what was their intent. Maybe Vietnam was a blunder. Maybe uh, there, because their local population was so much against uh, the Vietnam War, so the government was under pressure. So, so was the case in Afghanistan. But in Afghanistan, when they left, we felt that they left in a hurry. We felt they left in a chaos. But you see the kind of weapons they have left behind. Even Pakistan army doesn't have that kind of inventory. And what has happened because of that? Pakistan army and Afghanistan are now fighting. So in a way, Americans have achieved leaving the inventory there and uh, letting the Taliban handle it and see what is happening in Pakistan with TTP. The kind of chaos that has got created. They have not only stopped there, they are threatening even Iran. So what Americans wanted to do, I think they are good at playing chess. They know exactly that which piece has to be moved where, when, and let people fight. So that is my reading of uh, how it would have happened. But overall, if Americans interfere in a particular country, do you understand why that happens? Why they bring war to a doorstep? The American economy runs on arms industry. Huge amount of profits get generated. Huge amount of money gets generated for their budget. But the same is the case with China. The same is the case with Russia. Wherever you have arms lobbies or arm production, where will you sell it? Let us say all these fighter aircrafts and tanks which America is producing. You will sell it where there is a fight, no? Same is the case with China. You will sell it where there is a war or a conflict going on. Where are the wars going on? Okay, take Ukraine, that is one. But before 2020, where were the conflicts? Not essentially war, but where were the conflicts going on? It was going on in Yemen, it was going on in Nigeria, it was going on in Congo. And those were the different kinds of war where they did not, did not need fighter aircrafts. So where will fighter aircraft be sold? Either to India. Now India is stubborn, we don't want to buy from them. So they have to find some other customer. So they create a customer. So, But that is how uh, the real world is. After World War II, Japan and Germany who were otherwise big manufacturers stopped doing it. Otherwise you would have had one more person doing it. So that is how the world affairs help. So at your age, I also had stars in my eyes and I thought everything should be right. But this is a cruel and practical world. This is how it happens. They don't have any right. I agree with you. They don't have any right. And this issue of they are trying to protect democracy is nothing like that. Don't believe that. When for the last 75 years between us and Pakistan, which was the real democracy? India or Pakistan? So how much did America help us? They helped Pakistan. For a superpower, it is better to engage with a country where they can handle one person on top. If they try to handle it in India, next day parliament will gather. So democracy is very difficult to handle. But an autocracy or a dictatorship is easy to handle. And when the dictator like Saddam Hussein doesn't listen to you, it is easy to dispose him of us. This is a real world. Thank you, sir.
Thank you so much, sir. Let's take our next question. Yes, please. Jai Hind, Jabrar, sir. My name is Prahari Krishma Randhive and I am currently preparing for NDA written examination. So my question is, the motto of G20 Summit is One Earth, One Family, One Future. The people of this world are a family and to share a future together, we need a habitable present. But as we have seen, the developing nations have, over the course of time, immensely contributed to global warming due to rapid industrialization and unchecked growth. These countries are the main reason that climate change is a threat to humanity. We often see the global summits like COP that these countries keep preaching the underdeveloped and developing countries to reduce their carbon emissions. Although they have the resources and the technology to help and tackle climate change. But rather than sharing them, they are monopolizing them. Sir, what could be the solution to this problem? Thank you for your comment. Thank you. Hello. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Uh, thank you for your question. First of all, I believe uh, when we hear the terms such as the developing nations today are responsible for global warming because of their unchecked use of resources or their rapid industrialization, I believe it's not their fault but rather the fault of the global north because they went through industrialization at the cost of our resources. They went through industrialization at a time when the world was not talking about global warming. And now, when they, they've reached a developed stage, they want to prohibit other nations from growing by putting uh, checks and balances uh, in, in terms of global warming. Now, I don't mean to say that global warming doesn't exist. It very, very much does. But what this should mean is the global north should share its resources and technologies with the developing nations, you know. Uh, recently, India launched the International Solar Alliance. 50 years back, 30 years back, nobody could have imagined India leading uh, a renewable energy uh, alliance globally. This has happened, why? Because India went through its industrialization uh, phase. India is now slowly moving towards uh, achieving the superpower status. That is why now the West is now more and more afraid that India is becoming the voice of the global south and thereby creating checks and balances to ensure that that doesn't happen. When you share uh, renewable resources uh, with the countries that are unable to afford them or uh, when you remove uh, patterns, you encourage cross-border collaboration. This is what encourages people to grow and ensure that there is a uh, sustainable use of resources. I would like to give a very simple example of uh, our public digital health, uh, health module. So the digital health module that India has in terms of Ayushman Bharat or, or the, uh, the Ayushman card that we have come out with. India is now sharing that technology free of cost with uh, nations of the global south. They don't have to go through all the processes that India did to develop it. This means saving of resources, saving of human time, saving of uh, a lot of otherwise uh, unnecessary uh, energy that would have been utilized better. This is not the same uh, what we observe with uh, the western countries. The global north always adopts a holier than thou attitude when it comes to dealing with developing nations. It's time they get off their high horse and uh, actually contribute towards the development of the world. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Let's take our next question, please. Yes, please. Uh, thank you for recognizing me. First of all, I'm Maskana Grewal from Times of India. So first of all, I would like to ask permission if I could go ahead with my question coming in the ambit of you. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, sir, I had, since you were praising India on its stand of being non-allied with uh, quite a few situations that we have faced in the modern scenario. But uh, with our neighbours getting allied with superpowers and our sovereignty being threatened at every nook and corner of every war, uh, how long can we maintain our non-allied status with the bipolaring uh, strategies and geopolar issues of the world? And as a vigilant youth, I would also like to ask like, this room full of youth, how can we as youth uh, at national level or with policy makers like being given a platform such as Youth 20 and other platforms can collaborate and express our views on those issues. Uh, firstly, uh, 
we started after World War II with bipolarity. Then uh, after 1991, we went into unipolarity. And uh, we were obviously the leaders in the non-aligned movement. And uh, there were others also. Uh, I am not saying that we were the only ones. Egypt was there, uh, Czechoslovakia was there. So we have plenty of us. So, when we were non-aligned, we didn't want to become a part of the dirty politics. But over a period of time, we realized that every country out of the 177 countries couldn't have stayed their ground. So, gradually that started becoming weaker. We did not yield. We were still quite non-aligned. Whether uh, one of the superpower recognized that we were still non-aligned is a separate matter. But, okay, we may have had a certain amount of dependence extra over Russia because of our defense inventory, the USSR for that matter. It, it was a compulsion. You were pushed into that level. Uh, in 1962, the Americans gave us some help. 65, they were absolutely against us. 71, you know what happened, uh, the kind of comment which was passed by the US President about Indira Gandhi. I don't want to repeat it here. So, who pushed us into that corner? It was obviously somebody. And here, when you get into a defense inventory, it doesn't change for 30 years. Brigadier Kulkarni is here, he is a better expert than me to tell you that when you get a tank, the life of that tank is 30 years to 50 years. So you suddenly can't say that, uh, okay, I, I change. You can't change. So, that is how it was. Now, we've reached a stage where this Atma Nirbharta has taught us that Whichever may be your friend, but you better get your act going. Your dependence on others has to reduce. Now the world is possibly getting towards multipolarity. And in that multipolarity, we may be a small pole, but we will be there. So, how long will we be non-aligned? It's a different story now. It's not non-aligned, it is multipolar and we will possibly be one of the poles there. Uh, before I answer your question on how the youth can get involved in policy, I'd just like to add one more point, sir. Uh, another reason why a lot of nations align themselves with uh, a superpower is dependence on resources, dependence on arms and ammunition, or uh, in order to maintain their sovereignty. Uh, what we saw in the uh, Russia-Ukraine war is uh, how the American company Apple cut down Apple Pay, they, they cut down their digital finance systems, they, they you know blocked uh, mobile supply, the, the supply of mobile phones, Samsung did the same thing to them as well. With, with India, what we're seeing is we we've realized that we've learned that we're developing our own. Uh, you know, we, we recently launched our indigenous 4G technology as well. We're not dependent on uh, outside nations or communications technology. We have an independent uh, financial digital payment system as well. With the discovery of huge amounts of lithium in uh, Kashmir and in Rajasthan, we're now moving towards creating our own independent semiconductor industry as well. And semiconductor uh, semiconductor chips are useful in creating every single thing from from an anti-tank missile to your mobile phone, it's required in every single thing. So creating uh, independence of these sorts will is the reason why we're able to be multipolar and not have to align ourselves. And the second question that you said, how can youth align ourselves at a national level? Uh, obviously, this is an opportunity that has come once in 20 years. Uh, I don't believe any of us uh, are ever going to be part of the U20 again. We're all going to be in our 40s or 50s by the time the presidency comes back to India again. So apart from this, there are a lot of opportunities uh, that are out there. Uh, I we had this conversation just before we got here. We were having a, a casual chat uh, on a cup of coffee, and I, I I threw a question to the open room. I throw the same question to all of you as well. Uh, how many of you have opened up uh, Ministry of External Affairs, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Defence, for that matter, websites, and have checked out what their schemes are, what they're offering? It's an open question to the room. If you have, please raise your hands. Exactly. Now, uh, Ministry of External Affairs came out with uh, young professional opportunities for people to work with the G20 Secretariat and contribute to India's G20 presidency in a very concrete manner. Uh, Ministry of Commerce often comes out with young professional programs. I myself am a young professional working with the Ministry of Communications as well. So there are opportunities, but it's just that we aren't aware of them. I believe government is uh, can be a little bit of fault as well. They need to market it better so it reaches uh, to the youths. But at the end of the day, you can you can 
drag the horse to the lake, you can't make it drink water unless it's one. it wants to. So the need I would say is for our youth to become more curious, to ask more questions, to be inquisitive and uh, to hold the government accountable to a certain extent I would say that uh, why is this not coming out? What is there? What, what, what are you offering me? If we start asking these questions and we start looking out for these opportunities, there is an abundance of world out there for us to make a change. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question, please. Yes, please. Uh, sir, I uh, pointed out her. Uh, yes, yes. Jai Hind, Jai Prahar, sir. I am Kari Aditi Mishra from class 12th and I am currently preparing for the NDA entrance exam. So, looking at the agonizing destruction of World War I, the League of Nations was formed in order to build peace among the nations. But even after that, World War II occurred. And then, the United Nations was formed to avoid conflicts between countries. But so still, multiple conflicts have occurred even after the war. So, such as the Korean War, the Syrian War, the Vietnam War, and the most recent agitating war, the Russia-Ukraine War. So these organizations which have such foresight are failing to achieve their peace-building goals. Uh, sir, sir, in my opinion, I think these organizations are, are dominated by the, are overpowered by the dominance of the Western nations, where these nations don't let other nations to step in. So, for example, these nations use their veto powers to block any resolution that is passed against them or does not favor them. So, also taking the example of the International Court of Justice, if a judgment is passed, they do not have the authority to ensure its enforcement. So, sir, don't you think the United Nations should be restructured and emphasis should be paid on action rather than reaction? Uh, Sorry, sir, for interrupting. Uh, due to paucity of time, uh, I would request you to please uh, make it short, the answers. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, firstly, uh, League of Nations failed, so United Nations got formed after uh, World War II because maybe uh, the Treaty of Versailles was not so well drafted and uh, the feeling, uh, the feeling of uh, being uh, humiliated was so much in uh, Germany and uh, Hitler came up, Mussolini came up and at the similar time uh, the Japanese also came up. So possibly uh, that could have been one of the reasons uh, that uh, these countries did not want to be subservient to those who were the victors. That is one part. But uh, the examples that you gave, that is of the Korean War and uh, Vietnam War, I'll take the two of them. Those were more from the ideological point of view where the Americans felt that uh, communism cannot be allowed to spread because uh, Europe and America have been paranoid about communism. And uh, even uh, when the British were here, the great game, game about Russia, you can read about that. And most of our problems along the northern borders were because uh, the British wanted to retain control over the Pamir Nord, the uh, Tibetan plateau. So they wanted to uh, keep uh, Russians in check and not allow them to come to the warm water ports. So that was uh, what was going on in the mind of the Anglo-Saxons. Now, uh, whether Korean War is an outcome of failure of United Nations and Vietnam is also a failure out of United Nations may not be true. Because what you also correctly brought out, the, the powerful people sitting on the table decide what is to be done. Now, just as a part of humor, I'll tell you, uh, these countries who are sitting in those P5 of Security Council have lost wars. You look at Vietnam, French lost, Chinese lost, Americans lost. They are in that P5. Afghanistan, UK lost. America lost, Pakistan will soon lose, China will also lose. They are still in that P5. Vietnam is not there, Afghanistan is still not recognized. 
So everything doesn't happen based on what we feel. It is a question of who is powerful, who is controlling the global finances, who is controlling the number of countries. Most of these countries are still continuing with that uh, earlier colonial attitude. Everything is changing gradually. Maybe at some stage the reforms will take place. We have been pushing for the last about 20 years for reforms in the Security Council. At some stage it may happen. There is South Africa pushing for it, Nigeria is pushing for it, Egypt is pushing for it. There in Latin America, Brazil and Argentina are pushing for it. So at some stage there will be some change, but at the moment uh, I don't think they will yield power. We had got an opportunity, we lost it. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Let's take our next question. Yes, please, at the corner. Jai Jai Prasad. My name is Prahari Deshmukh and I am currently preparing for the NDA entrance. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, if you could make your questions a bit quick, please. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Sir, uh, looking at uh, the current world, sir, most of the conflicts are concentrated in Middle East, sir. Sir, and uh, sir, they follow a similar pattern, sir. Uh, uh, do, um, world powers uh, dominate over uh, the smaller countries and they do this by funding the terrorist organizations there, sir. Sir, taking example of, uh, say, Iran and Israel, sir. Sir, uh, they have, this conflict has been fueled by USA and Russia, sir. Sir, uh, Iran funds Hezbollah and Hamas in uh, Israel, sir, to conduct terrorism. And this causes a lot of chaos in that region. Sir, similarly, as you mentioned, USA, sir, sir they invaded Afghanistan in 2001. And sir, after they, when they left, uh, Taliban was able to take, take over. And sir, this uh, made the country fell into turmoil, sir. Sir, uh, so uh, what is the way forward so as to settle these disputes? And sir, uh, how can we ensure that the people suffering for decades can stop? Most of the conflicts are in uh, Middle East may not be a correct statement. Uh, there are conflicts happening elsewhere also. Uh, but okay, I will take your point that uh, there is chaos in uh, Iran uh, because of Hezbollah, Hamas. Uh, there is chaos between Armenia, Azerbaijan. Uh, that is another thing may not classically fall into Middle East, but there is. So, uh, now these superpowers make them fight. Again, the question goes back to the same thing, the fight for resources. If there are oil producing countries, uh, between World War I and World War II, the British had taken over most of these oil fields. So, when you blame Russia and uh, USA, uh, don't leave UK out of it. Because they've, been, they've had a major role to play in uh, this kind of a turmoil there. Now, uh, in a society which is not used to kind of governance the way the world wants and uh, they are on extreme, that is either extreme fundamentalism and uh, thereafter that country takes a very strong position that uh, you heard uh, Iran saying that they want to destroy every person living in Israel. When somebody takes such a stand obviously so, it is not only the superpower, but the others also who are uh, responsible for it. Uh, in any case, uh, if a country doesn't want to go to war, it will uh, take its own stand. So, uh, while they are fighting, what is it that we can do? We can always continue with trying to help that region to become peaceful. And India has been playing its part well. We have been making offers to many of these conflicting countries that we can help you, we can uh, bring peace to you. At times they are willing, at times they are not willing and many other countries also do uh, peace initiatives like as of now for Ukraine, South Africa is also wanting to do it. China is also making an offer. So those countries which are fighting, uh, the other countries, the moral duty is at that time to reach out and uh, bring in stability in that part of the country. And I don't think it would be correct to just blame somebody for that. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Next question, please. Yes, please. Please uh, ask questions directly. 
keep it short jai hind jai bharat sir my name is prari aryan singh and i am preparing for nd exam sir basically my question is related to border disputes as we have seen border disputes among many uh, countries like india pakistan israel palestine egypt sudan sir over the years india has engaged in four wars over territorial disputes sir to establish peace and foster development it is imperative to address these problems comprehensively so sir my question to you is how do you think it can be established and taking the example of india and china where border dispute have where, where diplomatic talks have failed totally due to lack of participation from chinese counterparts what are the ways through which these border disputes can be resolved and the three border disputes uh, location which you mentioned who were the colonial masters in all three british so you have to correlate that when they leave any place they create a conflict and vanish and for next 70 years you keep fighting and thereafter you cannot develop your economics to a level where you can compete with them it is to the credit of china and india that despite whatever problems we are having we have still come and pushed uk out of the economic race so this is how countries will do it is like in your childhood you would have seen that there are two children whose line is longer so one child makes his line longer the other one erases it so the british are known for that but how do we ensure that there should be no conflicts see border issues are something which are very difficult uh, to handle on both sides the population is very much attached to land okay here you look at your house if your neighbor comes 1 inch inside your uh, compound what will you do you will immediately fight no in india if any prime minister decides to give away land that government will not last even for 24 hours so both sides have to look at their domestic compulsions first and continue to negotiate and that is a statement which has been made by deng xiaoping that maybe our generation is incapable of resolving this let the future generation try their hand at it so it's nobody is in a hurry okay theek hai uh, we keep engaging each other but we don't yield we don't compromise on our sovereignty we will keep contesting every time they come they will be given a bloody nose but where is the final resolution of that conflict it will still take time the in the government part the boundary issue who is the custodian of the actual boundary is the ministry of external affairs so their job is to talk they will talk they will keep talking who is supposed to man the borders if these are peaceful borders mha man if these are active and volatile borders the mod man so at time we will do the talking at time they will do the talking at time we will do joint talking but uh, there is no hurry for us and we don't lose anything by continuing with the talks thank you sir uh, sir i'd like to add just one point to this uh, as you might be aware the y20 summit the first summit that just happened it happened in le the beautiful city of le and uh, the chinese did not uh, appoint a delegation to send to le they they refused to say sending uh, saying that uh, le is disputed territory uh now i'm not confirming nor denying this there was a newspaper article that said the chinese got uh all the youth delegations that were supposed to come to y20 uh to beijing for 3 days and they tried to uh, tell them how lay is not india's territory and it was a bold statement on our part to hold uh, such an important summit there and as a result of which uh every single country was represented at the y20 lay summit except china so how many ever uh, stands they take whatever they do uh, when the world knows that you're in the right and the world the world knows that india is a force to be reckoned with there's not much that can happen thank you sir uh, we would take a last question looking at the time yes please Jai Hind, Jai Prahar, sir. My name is Prahari Anjali Verma, and I am currently preparing for CDS exam. 
So as you said that media and information play a crucial role in shaping the minds of the youth. But conditioning minds through algorithm and open media is today's trend. But this conditioning is causing masses to become rigid and in their opinions and ideologies, which is creating conflicts inside the country and destroying the integrity of the nation. So the, uh, in this long term, this is threatening the peace of the country. Directly or indirectly, it is a uh, psychological war, sir. So I request you to guide us, how, what should we do to develop the inclu inclusiveness for uh, differing opinions and fluidity of our thoughts? Uh, China has a strategy of three warfares. And out of those three warfares, one is psychological warfare, one of those. Uh, so, you expect them to uh, identify our fault lines and then address that by psychological warfare. It, it is going to happen. Uh, they have identified very clearly that in a democracy, whether it is USA or whether it is India, there is so much of freedom, freedom of expression, freedom of speech, that uh, our social media is full of uh, people with varied opinions. Uh, that they have identified as a fault line which can create problems for our internal cohesion on whatever grounds. That internal cohesion has to be targeted and there they have used Pakistan in collusivity because Pakistan has a lot of uh, their elements embedded here. So those are called the sleeper cells. So uh, they both together are doing enough damage to us. Now what is our strategy? Our strategy is, when I started by saying that you all are cells, we all are cells of this human body, if there is a particular cell which gets contaminated, then you got to immediately contain it. You, you can't let it grow, it becomes cancerous. So that is where all of us, youth in particular, and the point which you brought out is so relevant that in 2019, I think, uh, was it 2020? I am not sure, but Prime Minister Modi was addressing the NCC rally. Every year he has a Prime Minister's rally. And in that, one thing I remember distinctly while I was sitting there, I heard him say, NCC and youth are the best source of removing disinformation and misinformation. When you yourself have an opinion there where you realize that this is a rumor, this is a fake, that is where it matters, where you have to tell somebody that don't be like whatever you got. You just send it to somebody else. You are circulating it. You are giving it a lot of publicity. While you should have been sending it back to the person who sent it, who gave it to you? How do you know it is true? And wherever it is a good message, you must definitely proliferate it. It's a simple thing to do. It, it doesn't require to do any PhD for that. And uh, again, if we try to say that information warfare or counter psychological warfare is only the responsibility of the government, we will never be able to achieve success there. Thank you so much sir. Thank you everyone for their participation and tremendous exchange of ideas. I must say that this was a brainstorming session. Prahar Samaj Jagrati Sansta is grateful and privileged to get an opportunity to collaborate with Y20 under G20. I hope this forum and ideas that are brought in this forum should take off in the world. Now I request Flight Lieutenant Shivali Deshpande, Secretary Prahar Samaj Jagrati Sansta, Director Prahar Defence Academy to propose a vote of thanks. I think that uh, there are many more inquisitive minds sitting in front of me, but apologies to all of you. Uh, due to paucity of time, we couldn't take your questions. But then I'm very sure that uh, General Kandare and Mr. Devansha are always uh, uh, open to all kind of uh, questions from the youth and they'll be they more than eager to answer at any time. As Mr. Devansha uh, mentioned, you know, let all of us get going on to the sites of the ministries and uh, check out as to how we can participate and some more discussions can come up and I think uh, you people also can play a role in uh, the governance mode. At the outset, I would like to take, uh, I would like to thank the guests, uh, General Khandare and uh, Mr. Devan Shah for uh, sparing their valuable time from their busy schedule. In fact, uh, General Khandare had an eye operation recently. 
yet he chose to come to talk to you all. So, so grateful to you from the bottom of our hearts. Mr. Devan Shah, I can imagine uh, how busy you are, sir, since uh, I see that you're the young blood in the policy making and uh, there are many eager eyes looking up to you uh, and also to your ministry to make uh, certain strong steps, to take certain strong, strong steps for the betterment of the country. We would love to hear from you as well, sir. So sometimes I'm very sure that uh, perhaps Sansta would invite um, Mr. Devin Shah and uh, have a rough brainstorming session because the, the youth have a lot of questions regarding media and uh, communication and uh, all these things. Sir. And of course, uh, my very old uh, friend, Mr. Sulab Deshpande, he came up to me and said, uh, Tai, why can't we have a session of Y20? And it's only because of you that this has happened. Grateful to you, Sulab, for uh, giving us the opportunity of organizing this uh, Y20 event. I think this has been, this has been uh, two hours of wisdom that we have got from Janakandari and Mr. Devan Shah. And I didn't understand how time passed away, but then there are some restrictions. All good things must come to an end. Uh, the esteemed audience here who's sitting in front of me, um, the guests, the invitees, thank you so much for uh, coming here, giving a uh, year here to these young minds who are going to carry the flag ahead of uh, our country. And... Uh, also participating in, in it and of course the brave prahari sitting in front of me yes your participation was uh, exclusive and it needs to be more so let us uh, continue these kind of discussions and sessions and i'm very sure that uh, uh, you will be more than glad to participate in more functions like this uh, thank you all last but not the least chitnavi center who's been very kind enough to provide us always with a hall, always with all the facilities that they can give. And of course the media who have always cooperated with us. You've been the mouthpiece of what Prahar is to the public. Grateful to you from the bottom of our hearts. The media has uh, done more than enough. And uh, I wish and I hope that you continue to do it. Sir. Thank you so much. Uh, Jai Prahar. Thank you so much, ma'am. Since we have come at the end of the program, I request you all to stand up for the national anthem. <laughs>